Welcome back for the fourth requirement of the Engineering Merit Badge. And this requirement is going to focus on learning more about engineers. And so specifically for this one, you're going to learn about the work that they do and the tools that they use, their current projects, the engineer's particular role in it, how, current, how the engineer's work is done and how, res, how results are achieved, and what project reports look like. And so for this one, although we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about it, uh, it's really going to focus on you finding an engineer to visit with. And so uh, that can be a family member who's an engineer. Uh, it can be a neighbor. Uh, it could be one of the engineers here at the National Advanced Driving Simulator. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that might work at, when we get to the end of this. And so we're going to start off by talking a little bit about some of the things that you're going to ask about. And so to do that, what I've done is I've kind of provided some very generic answers to these questions that you're going to ask for me and one of my colleagues here at the National Advanced Driving Simulator. Um, obviously, these, these answers are not meant to uh, serve as the, the answers you'll use in your workbook, uh, but it kind of gives you an idea of the sort of stuff what we're looking for uh, as you're asking questions. And so I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about myself. Um, and so the first thing you're going to note is that I'm a little bit of an odd duck there. I've got a PhD after my name, which means I've got a doctorate in engineering. Um, and so my focus is in human factors. And I've got not only a bachelor's of science in engineering, but also a master's and a PhD. And so the work I do may look a little bit different than some of the day-to-day -day work that other types of engineers do, particularly those that are that are in the trenches uh, and working in industry more than I am. And so for me, I do a lot of research. And so my goal is to improve traffic safety. And so two major components of the work I do, one of which is the assessment of system performance and how that can be uh, adjusted to maximize performance or how, how different system design options impact performance. And so. That's one aspect of the work I do. And the other aspect of the work I do is the role of impairment. And so uh, impairment can mean things like distracted driving, drowsy driving, uh, driving with alcohol or other drugs in your system, and how that impacts the overall safety of the, the, the human machine interface. And so that human machine interface in this case is the driver, the vehicle, and the roadway environment and other traffic. Um, and so that's, that's one of my current uh, major focuses. Uh, and I spent a lot of time working through the engineering process to try and answer uh, those questions. And so what are some of the tools that I use? Uh, and so the tools I use are MATLAB. Um, and when we talk about math, MATLAB is one of the tools I use to do a lot of math. Uh, and so I use MATLAB to process data from the raw binary form collected by the driving simulator and process that into uh, usable metrics I can use to evaluate system performance. Uh, I use another program called Statistical Application Software, or SAS, uh, and that's a tool I use to take that, that data that I derive from MATLAB and look at how different groups compare and, and, and to identify where uh, certain design options or certain manipulations either improve or don't improve safety. Uh, an in-house tool that I use is a tool called the Inter Interactive Scenario Authoring Tool, or ISAT. Uh, we use that to design the simulator scenarios that we use uh, for our research. Uh, also, it allows us to play the, the data back at the end and, and kind of visualize what is going on uh, in the environment. And the final tool I use is the, our driving simulators. We've got uh, two different tools. Uh, in terms of driving simulators that I, I frequently use, one of which is the NAS1, and the other of which is the NADS Mini Sim. Uh, and you can look at those more on our website uh, to get more detail on those. Uh, the NADS1 is a fully immersive uh, simulator. I talked a little bit about that in the achievements section uh, for, for an earlier requirement. Um, and the other one is the Mini Sim, which is a smaller version, uh, which is which is more flexible in terms of being able to run more subjects through it and, and having more instances instances of it available for use. Um, 
the next thing you're going to chat with them about is kind of some of their current projects and and what their role in them is. And so uh, this would be when you're talking with your engineer, this will be kind of requirement 4B. And so the current projects I'm working on are uh, drug driving and evaluating driver detection systems for drowsiness. Um, and although I spend most of my work right now working on the drug driving aspects of things, uh, that's a, a more complex problem and a little bit more abstract. And so I'm going to focus more on the evaluating drowsy driver detection systems. And so for that, uh, what we're interested in is, you know, for drivers who, who are growing drowsy, how can we, from an engineering standpoint, uh, make them aware that they're drowsy and help mitigate the effect of that drowsiness on driver safety. And so to that end, we look at how different detection systems work and how different interfaces work for providing feedback to the driver. And so it's a, it's a multifaceted problem. Um, and I'll focus a little bit on, on the aspect of the mitigation. And so from an engineering standpoint, uh, you know, depending upon the project that we're, uh, depending on the specifics of, of an individual study, you know, we're looking at different options associated with how to provide feedback to the driver. Uh, you know, some examples of things that we've looked at are things like using a coffee cup sort of icon on the display, in dash display to let the driver know that the system has detected that they're drowsy. Um, and, you know, that, that's one sort of interface. Another sort of interface that you might look at is one that encourages drivers to uh, pull over. And so there might be some feedback, which is that you've detected that they're drowsy, drowsy and provide some feedback. And still another uh, way of mitigating might be to turn on some advanced safety features. And so uh, whether that's turning on or adapting the, the thresholds on some of the crash warning systems that might be present in a vehicle is another method. And so what we're interested in doing is, is understanding how this sort of feedback is going to impact driver's ability to safely control the vehicle. And so what we do is we get people drowsy. And so uh, those studies generally involve having people uh, get up in the morning and then keeping them awake for a long period of time, uh, ranging up to 24 hours of, of continuous wakefulness uh, with minimal caffeine and uh, ingestion. And so we work to get drivers drowsy, and then we have them drive for a period of time. And drives we've used have ranged from relatively short drives of an hour or so uh, to drives lasting up to four hours. And then looking at how these mitigation systems provide feedback to the driver and how they respond to it. And so we look at, uh, at things like number of times that the driver drifts out of the lane as kind of a, a safety metric. Uh, we look at uh, standard deviation of lane position, which is a metric of how accurate the driver's control of the vehicle is. And so those are some of the things we look at there. And then at the end of the day, what we do is we compare them and we make recommendations in terms of interface design uh, based on the results that we observe. And so um, The next item up on our, our thing is, is, is kind of a more specific on how the work is done. And so um, I'm going to go back to a little bit more generic uh, problem. And so when we get a problem that I'm tasked with, uh, we start with the problem statement and we develop a methodology for the evaluation. So, you know, if we look at the question of impaired driving and the effects on safety, uh, the problem statement might be that, you know, more than 10,000 people per year die from alcohol impaired driving on, on the U.S. highways. And so that's our problem statement. And we then work through trying to figure out potential options for reducing that. And then we study how effective they might be. And so one option that we might look at is to look at what the impact is of changing the legal threshold for uh, driving under the influence of alcohol. Uh, Utah has is the first state that has lowered their BAC level to 0.05 uh, from 0.08. And we might look at how that is going to impact uh, safety and risk on the roadway. 
Another approach might be to look at an interlock system that has the potential to prevent people who are under the influence of alcohol over the legal limit from starting their vehicle or operating it. Um, yet another might be a system that monitors the driver's performance and looks for alcohol impairment. And so we would propose a potential solution. We would study then how effective it would be at identifying and preventing the impaired driving in this case. And so that is kind of that first step. Uh, what is, once that's done, once we've gone through that first step, we design a study. And so we look at things like how, how many subjects do we need? What are the characteristics of those subjects? Uh, you know, if, if we're going to do an alcohol study, we obviously want people who use alcohol or drink alcohol. Um, you know, we look at what are the requirements for the driving simulation? So how do we want the, the, the drive to look? Uh, can we, one of our existing drives work? Do we have to modify it in any way to uh, meet the needs of the study? Uh, and so those are all things that come into the develop system requirements. And so we're going to go through and, and create a specification document um, for the, both the study in general and for the driving simulation in particular. And so for me, those become a protocol uh, for the study design uh, that includes inclusion and exclusion criteria for subjects and kind of everything that's every step along the way in terms of how that study is going to be conducted. Um, as with any engineering study, you want it to be repeatable. So we want everything written out in excruciating detail uh, so that somebody else can come through and, and replicate the study very easily. Uh, and similarly, for the scenario specification uh, and simulator configuration, we want to specify exactly what that's going to look like uh, so that if somebody wanted to come back later, they could replicate what we did. Uh, the next step then obviously is to execute that protocol um, and conduct the study. Once that's done, we'll process the data, develop those, those metrics that we've identified in advance that are going to be important, and then analyze and determine how they're, they're going to work. And so the last portion of this is going to be to chat with uh, the engineer you visit with about looking at a report. If you're interested in some of my work, uh, you can go to the NADS website, and we've got links to some of the work that I've been involved with with out there. I've got a link here on here to one of the reports we've written for the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration that's publicly available. Um, one of the things to note with this is we're asking you to ask, uh, but some engineers might not be able to share it. Uh, engineers who work in, in particular industries may not be able to share it due to confidentiality issues or you know due to secrecy issues associated with the, with the work that they've done. Um, So next up, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of my colleagues, uh, Chris Schwartz, to kind of give you an example of how work might differ. Uh, he's also an odd egg because he's also got a PhD, but his is in electrical computer engineering. Uh, and I'll talk more generally about him, um, but it's the same sort of questions that you'd ask. And so with Chris, if we asked him about the work he does, he'd talk to us about the fact that he develops software models and simulations and that he conducts research on safety systems and automated vehicles. And so those are the two major areas he works in. And Chris could go into a lot more detail on that in terms of how he develops uh, models and software for the large simulators that we use, as well as his oversight and, and, and execution of simulator studies looking at uh, safety systems and automated vehicles. Uh, similarly to me, he uses MATLAB uh, as a tool uh, in simulating. He also uses other software such as Python, R, uh, he uses C++ uh, software as well, and he also does libraries and toolboxes for machine learning and signal processing. Uh, one of the things that Chris does within MATLAB is we have our own toolbox that we use uh, that has some custom work for us to process our simulator data, and he's responsible for keeping that up to date and making sure that works uh, and providing new functionality as we need it. Uh, so Chris's current projects are on distributed simulation. So that is easy to think about in terms of generally uh, we have a person interact with one simulator and, and they're interacting with virtual objects in that environment. Um, and easy way to think about this from, from a non-engineer standpoint is uh, when we talk about distributed simulation in a driving simulator environment, uh, it's almost like a multiplayer game. Uh, so 
you've got multiple people working in the same driving environment and they're interacting with each other. Uh, and in our environments, they might be relatively limited interactions. And so they might be driving and the interaction we're interested in between the, the two people in different simulators is only for a very short portion of their drive where something complex happens and we're interested in how how they respond jointly uh, when they encounter that situation. So an example might be linking our driving simulator with a pedestrian simulator. And so we might have a driver who's driving through a city environment and they're interacting with other vehicles and, and pedestrians along the way. And then the pedestrian is walking in the pedestrian simulator and they're crossing streets. And so we may come to a point where we have them both arrive at an intersection at the same time. And we look at how they interact as the vehicle tries to maneuver through the intersection and the pedestrian tries to cross the street at the same time. Um, some other work that uh, he is involved with is on quantifying drowsy driving. So that's a big area for us, um, as well as driver modeling for lane departures. And so there's a lot of things he, he is involved with. Um, which is often the case for engineers is there's not just one project they're working on most times. And then how is his work done? Um, again, similar to me, he develops a plan or a specification, uh, designs and implement, implements the software, uh, testing it along the way. Um, when we talk about the engineering process, this will become a little clearer. And then finally, what he does is explores data sets, reduces data and analyzes it to create models that are useful in the future. And I've got a link there to one of his reports on uh, transfer of control from highly automated to manual control. And so the task for you is to interview an engineer. And as we talked about earlier, you've got some options, one of which is to find an engineer in your community. This could be a family member. Uh, maybe you have a parent or a sibling who's an engineer, uh, an aunt or an uncle or a cousin, um, maybe even a neighbor uh, or somebody you know around town that that's willing to chat with you. Depending upon the city you live in, you may be able to chat with a, the, the city engineer uh, at, the, at the local municipality or the county engineer. And so there's a lot of options for doing it locally. And, and obviously this is a, a good opportunity uh, to, to, to get to know an engineer in your community and, and maybe make a relationship that will help you if you decide to go engineering to better understand uh, how you wanna move forward and what career opportunities you might wish to explore. And so obviously that's a that's a good option. Um, but another option will be to join us for an interview with one of our engineers on a video conference. And so we're going to set up some opportunities and you'll be able to find information on the website about when the next one is. And so obviously the disadvantage of this is that they're not going to be as readily available as uh, some of your local engineers will be. Uh, but we will make those interview opportunities available uh, periodically and check our website to, to see what the options are. Um, you know, obviously, if you have uh, questions, please send an email. Uh, for this requirement, what you're going to do is you're going to kind of go walk through the questions that are outlined in the workbook and in the merit, in merit, merit badge requirements. And you're going to kind of document those answers as you go along. And then when all is done, um, what I want you to do is kind of summarize what you learned about engineering for the visit. So kind of think back to the what they tell you about the work that they do and and give me a little overview uh, in requirement 4E in terms of what you learned from your opportunity to visit with that engineer. And maybe let me know whether or not it makes you more likely or less likely to want to pursue a career in engineering. With that, I want to thank you for being with us for this session and I look forward to you joining us uh, for requirement 5.